Now on to the final portion of the appendicular skeleton. We'll be looking at the pelvic girdle. The pelvic girdle consists of a complete ring. It's much more stable than the pectoral girdle. There are three bones involved in this pelvic girdle. There are two coxal bones or hip bones. Here's one and here's the other, as well as the sacrum. Now the sacrum we've already explored as part of the vertebral column, but it is fixed tightly to these two coxal bones. The pelvis is a bowl-shaped structure. It supports the trunk and the lower limbs, as well as protecting the viscera of the lower abdominal cavity, or lower colon, or urinal bladder, and our internal reproductive organs. The joint between the sacrum and the coxal bones is called the sacroiliac joint. This coxal bone, we're going to learn, is divided into three regions. This is the iliac region. The SI joint, as it's referred, is composed of the auricular surface on the ilium and the auricular surface of the sacrum. In the front, the coxal bones are joined by a piece of cartilage called the interpubic disc. The interpubic disc and the two coxal bones form the pubic symphysis. Now we consider that there are two regions of the pelvic bowl. There's the greater or false pelvis, which is between the flare of the hips. If we look at this sideways view, we can see where the false pelvis is. And the lesser or true pelvis is below the pelvic brim here. The pelvic brim is the margin that separates the false pelvis from the true pelvis. The pelvic inlet is this actual opening in here that's circumscribed by the brim. The pelvic inlet is the physical space that the baby's head would pass through during birth, followed by its body. The pelvic outlet is the lower margin of the lesser pelvis. So here you can see the pelvic outlet. It's easy to see this when you have your hands on Hank, our skeleton, and you can really examine the pelvis. When we look at each coxal bone or hip bone, there are three distinct features. We have the iliac crest, which is this long line across the top of the pelvis. The acetabulum, which is the hip socket where the head of the femur or thigh bone will go. And then the obturator foramen, this large hole that's below the acetabulum. Now the coxal bone is divided into three regions because it results from the fusion of three bones developmentally. The ilium, which is the bone that has the iliac crest all the way across the top of it, is the largest of the pieces. The ischium is the part that we sit on, the inferior posterior portion of the hip. And the pubis is the pubic bone. It's the most anterior portion, shown in pink here. On the ilium, we have some big features. So we know already that this is the iliac crest. There are four spines on the iliac crest. So here are the four spines. There's one here, there's one here, there's one here, and one here. And they're named accordingly. This will really test your knowledge of the language, so to speak. So the anterior superior iliac spine, this is the one that's highest and on the front side. And then we have the posterior superior iliac spine because it's the highest one on the posterior side. Then we have the anterior inferior iliac spine and the posterior inferior iliac spine. We can feel the anterior superior iliac spine quite clearly when we look for our hip bones. Now when we look at the ischium, 
we'll see clearly the ischial tuberosity. The ischial tuberosity is the sitz bones. The ramus of the ischium is this piece right here. And we'll also see a greater and lesser sciatic notch. This is more clear when you get your hands on Hank. This is where the sciatic nerves will run through. When we look at the pubic bone, we'll see that the pubic bone has a body as well as a superior ramus and an inferior ramus. So it's important to refer to these rami in terms of what are they the ramus of. We've seen this word come up already. We've seen the ramus of the mandible. Now we have rami in the pubis also. So we have the ramus of the ischium, or we could have the superior ramus of the pubis, or the inferior ramus of the pubis. Really important to be specific here. Keep that in mind when we do our skeletal tours. The way that you'll be tested on this material is by doing a tour of our skeleton in the classroom. You'll be given a region to tour me through, and you'll tell me every single thing about that particular region. We'll do one region of the skull and one region of the regular skeleton. Now, when we look at male and female pelvises, they differ. That's how we know that Hank is Hank. He's a male. The male has a much heavier and thicker pelvis because they exert greater forces on it with these stronger muscles. And as you've already learned, the action of muscles on bone cause it to become thicker, heavier, and stronger. The female pelvis is much wider and shallower, and it's adapted to the needs of pregnancy and childbirth. Thus, it has a larger pelvic inlet and a larger pelvic outlet to allow passage of the infant's head. Look here in the male's pelvis. You can see that the coccyx turns in at a much sharper angle. It would be hard to get a baby's head through here without poking a hole in the top of it. Another thing we'll notice is that the pubic symphysis or the pubic arch in men is 90 degrees or less. And in women, it's greater than 90 degrees, usually about 120 degrees. This is the fail-safe way that I use to tell the difference between a male and female pelvis. So go ahead, add all these portions of the pelvis to your diagram. I would start with the three regions of the pelvis, the ilium, ischium, and pubis. And then some of the major features of each coxal bone. Don't forget to note how we determine male from female pelvis. Now let's move on to the lower limb. Just like the upper limb, the lower limb is divided into four regions, and there are 30 bones in each limb. There's the femoral region, which is the thigh. It extends from the hip to the knee. It contains two bones, the femur and the patella. The crural region is the lower leg, it extends from the knee to the ankle and contains the tibia and fibula. In the tarsal region, we're looking at the ankle. This is where we see the union of the crural region with the foot. And the pedal region is the pes or foot. It's composed of seven tarsal bones, five metatarsals, and 14 phalanges. Now, there's some commonalities between the structure of the arm and the leg, so it's going to be important to not mix up some of the terminology here. Again, we have one bone in the upper arm and one bone in the upper leg, two in the lower arm and lower leg, and then we have the tarsus, which is analogous to the carpus of the arm, and the pedal region, analogous to the hand. So we'll see some similarities in the themes here. Let's begin with the femur. The femur now looks pretty similar to a humerus, but it does have some distinct differences. It's the longest and largest bone in the body. It has a hemispherical head that articulates in that acetabulum. So the acetabulum is covered in cartilage, and so is the head of the femur. And so they slip nicely across each other. 
On the very top of the head, there's a fovea capitis. It's a little ditch. We'll notice that there's a neck between the head and the trochanter. We'll see a greater trochanter and lesser trochanter. The greater trochanter is the largest feature other than the head at the top of the femur. And the lesser trochanter is the next largest bump. This is the intertrochantric crest. It joins the greater and lesser trochanter. We'll also see there's an intertrochantric line. The intertrochantric line is on the anterior view of a femur. Here's the intertrochantric line. So the intertrochantric crest is on the posterior side. The linea aspera is a ridge on the posterior shaft. This is a pretty prominent feature right here. You'll definitely feel it if you get your hands on Hank. We'll also see a pectineal line and a gluteal tuberosity on the posterior side. The pectineal line is otherwise known as the spiral line. So the spiral line and the gluteal tuberosity come together to form the linea aspera on the posterior side. When we look at the more distal end of the femur, we'll see that there are medial and lateral condyles. Now, they're easier to remember on the femur than they are up on the arm because we're just calling them condyles instead of trochanter and capitulum. So the medial condyle is the slippery surface on the medial side, and the lateral condyle is the slippery surface on the lateral side. That makes it pretty easy. And above the condyles, we have epicondyles. The epicondyles are just right here and here, just these points. And you can see them from either side of the femur. There is an intercondylar fossa between the two condyles on the posterior side. And on the anterior side, we'll see a patellar surface. It's also covered with cartilage. And that's where the patella will articulate. The patella is a triangular sesamoid bone. It's embedded in the tendon of the knee. At birth, it's cartilaginous. But as we develop, it becomes ossified, probably by about three to six years old. The quadriceps femoris tendon extends from all the anterior muscles of the thigh to the patella, where it continues as the patellar ligament. So the patella is inside that tendon, and then the tendon goes down and inserts on the top of the tibia. So now let's look into the lower portion of the limb. We'll look at the tibia and fibula. The tibia is the large bone here, and it's located on the medial side. The fibula is the small bone here, located on the lateral side. The tibia is definitely the weight-bearing bone of the lower leg, or the crural region. It has a broad head up at the top and it has two articular surfaces on it that match those on the bottom of the femur. They're called the medial condyle and lateral condyle. They have the same name. That's quite convenient. Right between each of these condyles is an intercondylar eminence. This ridge separates the two condyles from each other. On the anterior side, we'll notice a tibial tuberosity. You can feel your own tibial tuberosity. It's the most prominent feature just below your kneecap. And it's the site for the attachment of the quadriceps muscles. Further down on the shaft of the tibia, we have the anterior crest. It's a fairly sharp, angular piece of the tibia. You can also feel that as you run your fingers down the front of your shin. And the only feature we really need to know on the most distal end is the medial malleolus. The malleolus are the ankle bones. So we have a medial malleolus on the base of the tibia. 
Now let's look at the fibula. It's a slender lateral strut and it's there to help stabilize the ankle. It doesn't bear any body weight. So often it's used for bone tissue grafts in the case that someone's lost bone elsewhere that they need replaced. It has a head on the proximal end which has an apex, just a point. And at the distal end we'll see the lateral malleolus. This is the lateral ankle bone that you can feel prominently. These two bones, just as in the bones of the forearm, are also joined by an interosseous membrane. Inter meaning between, osseous meaning bone. So it's a membrane between the bones. It adds to stability in the lower leg. Okay, just checking in. Hopefully you've been keeping up on continuing to build your outline of all the bones and their features and also keeping up in Anatomy and Physiology Revealed, looking for each of these features. Now let's move down into the foot. The tarsals are the ankle bones. They're arranged in proximal and distal groups, just like the bones of the wrist. Now the way I remember carpals from tarsals is kind of a funny one. We drive a car, as in carpals, and we walk on tar, as in tarsals. The tarsal bones are shaped and arranged differently from the carpal bones because of their load-bearing role in the ankle. The calcaneus is the largest of the tarsal bones. The calcaneus is the big heel bone that we can feel the back of our foot. And the most distal portion of it is where the calcaneal tendon or the Achilles tendon attaches. The talus is the next biggest bone. It sits right on top of the calcaneus and actually forms the ankle joint with the tibia and fibula. Below, it articulates with the navicular. So the talus sits right on top of the calcaneus and also a little bit with the navicular. The proximal row of tarsal bones are those three the talus, calcaneus, and navicular. The distal row are made up of the medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiform bones. So there's three cuneiform bones and a cuboid bone. Now the cuboid bone is on the pinky toe side and it's pretty easy to tell apart because it's very cube-like in structure. And then the other three are all called cuneiform. The medial cuneiform is on the medial side of the foot, or the big toe side. And the lateral cuneiform is the one that's closest to the cuboid, which is on the lateral side of the foot. And then the one between those two is called the intermediate cuneiform bone. So there's no good mnemonic here to memorize these with, but they're all pretty straightforwardly named. Now in the foot, we have the same bones as we have in the hand, the metatarsals and the phalanges. The metatarsals form the body of our foot. And they're numbered one through five, just like they are in the hands, beginning on the big toe side. The big toe is known as the hallux. Remember the thumb was known as the pollux? That'll come up more when we start looking at attachments of muscles. Again, we'll see the base is proximal, the shaft is intermediate, and the head is most distal. After the metatarsals, we'll see the phalanges. In the same arrangement as we see them in the hands, there are two in the great toe, or the hallux, and three in each of the other toes. Again, they're named proximal, medial, and distal phalanx. In the big toe, we only see proximal and distal. So as we look at the foot, you're aware of arches. If you've ever looked at bare, wet footprints, we see that there's a big arch missing. Now there are actually three arches in the foot. There's the medial arch, which is that one that's missing in footprints. It's the medial longitudinal arch. It leads from the heel to the hallux. The lateral longitudinal arch is much less of an arch. It's along the lateral side of the foot. 
Sometimes you can see it slightly show up in a wet footprint. There's also a big transverse arch across the middle of the foot. This arch is what allows the passageway for many of the tendons that operate the bones in the foot. There's not much space for muscles within the hands and feet themselves. So many of the muscles that operate joints in the foot and hand are located either in the lower leg or the forearm. But this transverse arch in the foot allows space for passage of many of these tendons and of course blood vessels. They wrap down around the malleoli on the medial and lateral side of the foot and then pass down through this transverse arch. So after you add all of this material to your outline, be sure to go out to Anatomy and Physiology Revealed and become very familiar with the bones before you show up to lab next time. Because there, we're going to spend some time getting hands-on hang and giving each other tours through all of the different bones in the body, as well as their features. By talking about it, we'll be able to learn it best. So I'm going to put you on the spot and have you make mistakes and get it wrong so that eventually you'll understand where all these features are and get it right. So why not start practicing now? Again, you have the skeleton. Practice.